Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Gwyn Batten. And Gwyn, oh my goodness, there's so much to say about Gwyn. She's a British rower. She's won silver at the 2000 Summer Olympics. She was part of the quadruple skull with her elder sister, Miriam. She's also set the record for the fastest solo crossing of the English Channel, which she did in a time of 3 hours and 14 minutes, which was faster by eight minutes than the men's record. Hi, Gwen. How are you doing? Hi. Lovely to be on your podcast. Oh, it's exciting to have you on. Now, Gwen, I did a very brief introduction. To be honest, it possibly would have taken me the whole podcast to read out all of your different accomplishments. But how would you best describe yourself? Well, really simply, I I guess I'm just a rower. um, And I've just found various extremes in my sport of rowing to go and um, head out and do. Um, You know, and while I was... um, fit and young I was doing the um, Olympic distances and going to the sort of edges of possibility of, of what was possible for human um, human fitness and then I guess now I just want to be out on the water and doing stuff and so I row on the ocean now or on the sea. Oh fantastic have you always been a rower or when did you first start rowing? I started rowing when I was 19 um, I was you know I know you always ask this question of your guys um, at school I absolutely loved sport um, in all its forms. Um, and if anything, it sport learning, I learned the sort of rules of life through the rules of sport, a really interesting experience um, through that journey. And so I owe a lot back to sport. But it wasn't until I was 19, and my sister was at university, and I was at Southampton, and I was reading ship science, and I wanted to be design America's Cup yachts, like, you know, all crazy 16 year old girls want to do when they grow up. And I, um, and I, my sister was rowing, and she said, Gwen, Gwen, you want to try rowing, you'd be really good at it. And I wasn't. Um, they have a special race in rowing for rowers that have never won anything. It's called your novice pot. And I took three years to win my novice pot. Um, but that didn't actually stop me. You know, I, I thought that if my sister could do it, I could definitely do it. Um, and so by the age of 24, I, I was on the edge of the GB team. Oh, my goodness. And what was it about rowing that you loved? Um, I think some of it was the – it's there's a lot of camaraderie. You know, if you if you're in a so if I'm in a hockey team or a, a rugby team or a football team, the next best person is in the second team in my position. So the next best centre forward is in my position. In rowing, the next best person is sitting behind you, helping you to get better. Um, if you don't turn up for a training session, the boat can't go out. Whereas if you're just doing drills and stuff or, or playing a game, you can even play one man down. You can't go rowing one woman down. Um, so there's a real sense of commitment and a real sense of helping each other um, to the extent that, you know, even when you're training, say training on the holidays, you want your team to be training as well. So, you know, you'll give them a ring and say, how's training going? Because at the end of the day, you're going to be sitting in the boat with them. And that sense of togetherness um, is, is, you know, something that's really special with rowing. But also just the fact that in a rowing boat, you're absolutely flying across the top of the water, which um, I've always loved doing. Because you, you've got um, your older sister introduce you to it. Have you and your sister always been close, sort of growing up? No, I mean, I, well, my, both my parents, um, both my parents lived abroad. In fact, they met abroad in, in northern Nigeria um, in the fifties, um, and we um, we were brought up as kids in West Africa in the Middle East. And we, I mean, I went to boarding school age nine. Um, my sister's three years older than me, so I was six when she went to boarding school, and we were never really. We were never really close. I used to hang out with my brother a lot. Um, and so I got really close with my brother. So my sister and I went, she, I got thrown out of my sister's school um, when I was 11 because um, I couldn't quite come to terms with what, you know, having lived in Africa and running around, you know, barefoot, suddenly coming and wearing, you know, prim, prim clothes and expected to do everything between nine and four. Um, I, I got thrown out of school. So I never even went, I'm, you know, about two years, I went to the same school as my sister. Um, and then my pretty much um, was much more sporty and much more outdoor education wise. Um, and so really, um, it was only we only have really got close um, when we were and, and when we were adults. And now my brother lives in Sydney. And so I hardly ever see my brother. But my sister lives with her family five minutes from me. So what's quite interesting is a childhood 
we didn't spend a lot of time together. But then as, as adults, um, we do spend quite a lot of time doing stuff together um, in and around rowing as well. I mean, rowing is it's like a lifestyle more than anything else. The commitment, the dedication, the focus, the training that goes into it. So you started at university, took you three years to win the Novice Cup. When did you start thinking about the Olympics or getting into the GB squad? How did that progression happen? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it's quite interesting. If you talk to a lot of Olympic athletes, they sort of make their their dream, their sort of dream goal when they're between the ages of about 10 and 14, somewhere around there. And I was 12. And I remember watching the Olympics on television and thinking, you know what, I want to go and be at the Olympics. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to be in the middle of that athletics track with all those people on television saying how amazing and how hard I trained. It hadn't occurred to me that I wanted to win a medal or anything. Um, And that desire to, to be really good at sport, I think came from then. Um, And I remember, I remember, um, deciding that I was going to go to the Olympics as a cross-country runner hadn't occurred to me that you know they don't have cross-country running at the Olympic Games so um and it, I just happened to be at the point where I I won the area championships I won my county championships which meant that I could go to the English schools and um so I remember standing on the start line at the Olympic at the um at the English schools thinking right I need to win this and then next time I'll go to the Olympics um and I I came 303rd and so, of course, my maths was I managed to work out how many you know, people, because, of course, I was 12 years old and how many people older than that meant that I wasn't going to be going to the Olympic Games. And I remember being devastated. And I, I remember thinking, well, if I can't be good at one sport, I'm going to be really good at as many sports as I possibly can, which is why I think I did loads and loads of sport. I was one of those annoying kids at school that would sign their name up to all the after school clubs and then have to choose which one I was going to because <laughs> they were going on at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I just was obsessed and I loved sport. If I read all my letters going back to my mum and dad, um, in Africa and the Middle East, they're all about how I scored a goal in hockey or how I did this or that. Um, so totally obsession with sport as a, as a kid. What was it like when you did make the GB team? Um, I think the, the real challenge for me was that I knew that physically I was capable of making the team. So and that was some of the reasons why I really struggled with rowing, because I was quite um, I was quite strong. I was um, I was competing at shot and I had quite an inherent endurance base. And on the rowing machine, I could beat the national team. There, there used to be a competition. I was at, and I actually would win it. I won it for three years in a trot, beating the national team. What I wasn't good was technically good enough to go. So I had to work really hard at my technique and my efficiency. And so. You know, I sort of knew and my sister was on the team and I knew that, you know, pound for pound, she'll hate me for saying this, but pound for pound, I, I reckon I could beat her. So I was trying to get in the team in what they have rowing and rowing is where you have one oar on one side of the boat. In America, they call it sweep. And so you have to race off in pairs. And I went, got through to my first set of final trials and I came in the top six. And they took six people to the world championships that year. They announced it and my name wasn't on the list. And so I was moaning like hell to my friends. And in the end, they just dialed the chief chief coach's telephone number um, and handed me the phone. And I I asked him, I said, you know, I came in the top six. You've selected six people for the world championships. Why didn't you select me? And the chief coach said to me, Gwen, you're too small. You will never be an international rower. And, you know, for me, that was the second time in my life that my dream of going to the Olympics or becoming a GB international, which is what I had then translated into, had gone. I remember this was exactly what I needed because it was exactly 12 months to that very weekend. I was ranked eighth in the world in the single skull. How how tall are you? So I'm 5'7". So it's about 171. Yeah. So for a rower and, you know, I wouldn't get into the rowing team today, but I guess one of some of the reasons was, was that at the time Great Britain weren't that good at rowing, you know, but I was really good on the rowing machine. I was always able to beat the big guns. And so for me, it was a lot about technique. And if I put myself in the single skull, then nobody could turn around and say, oh, well, it was Gwyn's partner that made them go that quick. And it was I was able to prove to myself. And I, so I managed to get into the ranking, had a World Cup at the time for the single skulls. And so I didn't have to have any of the national team funding. I funded myself out to all the international regattas. And I remember getting my first um, my letter through the post to say, congratulations, Gwyn, you've been selected to represent Great Britain at the World Championships. It's going to cost you one and a half grand. 
and I had spent all my money, I had spent all my holiday, I had nothing left. And I remember just sitting there and crying because I couldn't do it. The one point in my career where I'd achieved what I'd set out to do, I couldn't afford to go. What did you do? It was it was really I mean what I did was I, I sent letters to all my all my family my extended family and asked them all to put fifty quid in that didn't really get me that much actually it got me some um, I went to the I was I went to my rowing club and I talked to the guys behind the bar all the guys in their their sixties and seventies that used to buy half a pint to make it last for three hours because I used to um, work the bar I used to run the bar at the rowing club um, I went to the guys behind the bar and then all of a sudden they um, there was, you know, one of the lap chaps came up to me and said, Gwen, you don't need to worry about the money. We'll sort it out. And they put their hands in their pockets and they found the money for me to go to my world, first world championships. And they set up from that, they set up a trust now, a charitable trust, which helps young people to go, young rowers to go to, um, to world championships from those, that group of um, men around the bar. So it was pretty amazing and they were lovely and I was indebted to them. And that was literally about, four or five years before the National Lottery came on board. In fact, two years before the National Lottery came on board, um, which made a huge difference. But, you know, I was um, sleeping on changing room floors. I was, I came up with something called housing sponsors. I worked out that you needed to to train. You needed to be able to um, eat. You needed to have a car to get to my coach because my coach was in Nottingham and I needed to transport my boat and I needed to pay for accommodation. Those were my three outgoings. And if I didn't pay for accommodation, I could then go part time, which meant that I could do enough training to go to the um, go to the Atlanta Olympics. But the problem was after about six months, I started to get ill. Um, because I spent my entire time, you know, a friend would go, you know, get married and go on a honeymoon. I'd move in. Somebody else would go on holiday. I even met. I even met a guy at a meal and he was going, um, he was sailing across the Atlantic for three weeks and I moved into his house and I've never seen him since to say thank you. But he gave me his keys that night and I moved into his house. It's amazing how, you know, people are so generous within sport and so trusting. Um, and yeah, so it, it was only because of the real gift of the guys behind the bar and, and the community that allowed me to get to my first world championships. One of the things I'd almost want to go back to is there was those two bits there, which is sort of the disappointment. Is one is that that phone call, the rowing coach telling you you're never going to make it, you're never going to be an international rower. Then the second one, realizing that you've made this incredible competition, but then knowing that financially you just didn't have the money, you weren't going to be able to do it, and it's that crushing dis- disappointment. And that happened to you. I'm sure it's happened to you more than once um, through, throughout your life. How do you handle that disappointment? How did you get back up? Why did you keep trying? I think I think the one thing I've learned from my learned myself, often if things come easily, I don't value them enough to really, really want something. And it's when you want something so much that it hurts, you're prepared to put so much more on the line. So I have this saying, and it's it basically is the 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 mountains are only high. You only really value the victories if the valleys are deep. And the deeper the valleys, the most amazing um, victories you get. I mean, the chief coach, um, I spoke to him many times after that, um, after I'd gone to the, my first world championships. And, you know, I'd say thank you. Because if he hadn't done that, I don't think I would have been successful as I was. So I think there is a type of person where you have a choice. When you get really big kickbacks in life, you have a choice. You can either go with them and believe them. OK, which means you're probably going to give up or you'll just step back or you have to try another way. You know, so and I think I often go into schools and, you know, I say the one thing my school taught me was that no doesn't mean no. No means go and find another way. If you can't get through the front door, get through the window, get through the upstairs window, go and get a ladder, climb around the back of the garden. I think if sometimes those kickbacks allow you to really ask yourself, do I really want to achieve this? So tell us about your first world championships. What was that like? You know, scraping together the funds, getting the money together, doing the training. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, you know, I'd been following, you know, because my sister had been at the world championship. I'd gone along as a groupie. Um, I'd been a groupie in the 92 games in Barcelona and had loads of fun. And here I was with my kit on and racing. It was in the USA. It was a place called Indianapolis. And it was it was amazing. I was rowing amongst the the gods of my sport. And here I was. It was quite scary because I was in the single skull, 
which meant that I was doing it on my own. Um, I came um, I came second in the B final, which mine came eighth. So I came eighth that year. And it was a great year. You know, there were some real gods out rowing in my event. And, you know, to be lining up against them and racing them was amazing. You've been to six world championships, two Olympic Games. Your international career has spanned nine years. Looking back throughout that time period, what's been the biggest challenge that you faced? I think the biggest challenge is always um, when you, when you, well, so many challenges, to be honest. And a lot of what you're trying to do is to um, make sure you don't get ill, don't make sure you don't get injured, make sure that you're always competing against your teammates to make sure you get in the best boat. And then all of a sudden you've got to switch from being competitors against each other into um, teammates. And so you've now got to bring a boat together in the space of 10 days sometimes to race at a World Cup to go out there and deliver. And so I guess the you're always dealing with challenges. There's the one thing that is great about it is the simplicity of your vision. You know where you're going and what you need to do. But I guess the dark moments for me were probably when I was injured after my, my first year on the team. I spent um, about eight weeks um, you know, not doing anything, not being able to do any rowing. And then I took about another three months to be able to come back to full training, mainly because of a back injury. You just use every bit of energy you have trying to get better rather than get fit, you know, and tracking down the best physios in the country and just networking to find out who who deals with this type of injury the best. That was probably right at the beginning. That taught me a lot. I had to start doing a lot of core stability and a lot of Pilates and working out how to control injury pain rather than just endurance pain. And then I guess the toughest time was in in 2000. I had a really bad hypermobile disc in my neck and I hadn't realized what it was. I kept thinking I had an uh, in- sh- uh, elbow injury and I kept oh, saying to the physio, oh, and will you look at my neck at the same time? And we never connected the two. Um, and so, you know, the 2000 Olympics, I was really surprised that I even went because the Christmas of that year, I couldn't even get out of bed. My neck was so sore. So, you know, it's again, it was a classic. I had the highest mountain in 2000 from the lowest valley. Let's talk about the Sydney Olympics. The 2000 Sydney Olympic Games. I mean, wow, it must have been incredible to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, for rowing, it was probably one of the most perfect regattas ever. I mean, the regatta course up in is incredibly fair regatta course up there. We had perfect conditions. And, you know, it was, you know, the Australians did it really well. For us, the British women, we'd always come fifth at the Olympic Games. So the women's eight in Los Angeles in 84 had come fifth. There'd been a double, I think, in um, a double in Seoul that had come fifth. And my sister had come fifth in Barcelona. I'd come fifth in um, Atlanta. So you can almost imagine all the countries in the world lining up and saying, oh, well, there's Great Britain. They're going to come fifth. You know, we all that was as, <laughs> that was as good as we ever got. And, and, you know, women had only rowed in the Olympics since the 70s. And we we were coming into this and that we'd won some medals. So as a squad, as a national squad, we'd won some medals leading up to it. So we knew we could medal at a world championships. But the case was at the Olympic Games, something really different happens. So what, what would win you a medal at a world championships won't get you into the final at the Olympic Games. It's just because it's so much more emotive and people train so much harder because they want it more for the Olympics. And we had an absolute shocker. I mean, I was I couldn't do all the pre-trials running into that. My sister was really struggling as well. She had some form of overtraining. Um, we tried to do my sister and I wanted to go in the double. We hadn't been made put into the double. So we were put into a quad. It wasn't the top boat. Um, then about six weeks out, um, one of the crew um, bust her rib um, while we were rowing and stress fracture. She had to reselect the boat. So we literally formed our crew five weeks before the Olympics. And normally that's a death nail. If you're changing your crew around five weeks before a major championships, it's not going to go quick. Um, And we just literally got our heads down and we trained harder than we've ever trained before. We were doing 20% more mileage than the men were doing. When we got out to Australia, we didn't bother with getting over with any jet lag. We just went out because we were playing catch up the whole time. We have a race in rowing just before the just before you go to the Olympics, it's called the um, race for percentages. And all of the all of the racing crews will line up and race 2000 meters. And everyone works out what percentage they've done of their gold medal time. And um, we won it. 
And it was like, oh, my God, we're quick. And we had, you know, because we'd been so busy training, getting our heads down and thinking, oh, my God, we could just make sure we get ready for the Olympics. We, we came out of that training camp going into Sydney, knowing that we were quick. But, of course, we didn't know how quick we were um, compared to our competition. Bringing the team together five weeks to go, how did the team come together? I mean, what happened in that? So did somebody take ownership or control? Was there like a team leader? Was there the captain? Or was it, was it purely a, everybody taking equal share and responsibility? Well, we, have, um, we had a guy called Mike Spracklin. He's one of the most famous coaches, rowing coaches in the world. And he, he's got a very brutal style. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard. But he is a, he's a phenomenal coach. And so he was pretty much leading us through. He would, t- he would write our training program every day. He was the one that was playing with our brains. You know, Gwyn, you think you're hard. Well, you wait till, do you know what I mean? He, he, he coaches you not only physically, but technically and mentally as well. Um, and so he very much led all of that. And he's coached crews from all around the world to Olympic gold medals. I mean, he coached Steve Redgrave to his first two Olympic gold medals back in the 80s. Um, and then he's coached around the world. And he's a phenomenal coach. So he led us in many ways. Um, the challenge is we all knew each other and we'd been, we knew because we trained together as a squad, because if you're in rowing, you have to come and live together and train together all the way through the year. You can't live in different parts of the UK. So we knew each other. But the whole point is that um, we had to race off five weeks before it was in a, a beautiful lake in, in the south of France. We had to race off for the last place in the boat. And once we had that that place, Gillian Lindsay got into the place in the boat. We then had five weeks to make sure that we could, um, apps, our precision, our technical precision was perfect. Um, and that was the bit that was a really tough bit. I don't know whether you have it in, um, in team, team events, but you have people that are team makers and they, they, they make the crew feel really comfortable. Um, and then you also ought to make it work really well. You also need drivers you know, people who say that wasn't good enough. We want to go more. Let's aim for this. We need to do this. Um, and we had a really good balance in the crew, um, in the Sydney crew. My sister's very much a team maker. Catherine's very much a team maker. And Gillian and I are the two drivers. We, we pretty much managed to use the five weeks to bring ourselves together as a unit um, before we went into Sydney. I think with the Olympics, I mean, the pressure knowing that like a billion eyes are on you, everybody's looking to you, this, you have trained, whether it's in four year cycles or all of your life to get to this point, to get to this race, to get to this moment, to get, you know, that five second countdown before the whistle or the gong goes off. How do you utilize that pressure or use that, those emotions that you must be feeling to make sure that you can get the best out of yourself in that situation? Yeah, and I think it, it is it is exactly like that. You know that the that you've got the world watching you, but to be honest, it becomes very personal. It's something you've practiced and trained for for ten years for this moment, not five seconds later, not five seconds before this moment in time. And your ability to focus and attention is just absolutely stunning. You, you in fact, to be honest, you're so scared you don't want to do it. And then you, I mean, what we, we practiced our race over and over again, even in training, you know, um, I could, I could visualize my race bang on time. So if you started me to visualize my race, it would take me exactly the time it takes us to race it. And we would just break it into chunks, two strokes off the start and five strokes and 10 strokes and 20 strokes. And then it was pretty much stacks of 20 strokes all the way down that course. And the key, I think the key the key bit is to make sure you've done all your homework. So you're as fit, physically fit as you can possibly be. You're as mentally strong as you can be. You know, you've done your race plan. You've done all the scenarios that are going to take place. You've spent 10, you know, you might have spent 10 hours talking about one word and one call over the period of the preceding weeks about what that call means. And everybody knows what it means to them. And then what you layer into that is your emotion. And you layer in your emotion in such a way that you're able to perform like you've never performed before. So I I guess I will, here's here's a a question. So if you saw a million pounds, it was underneath the car, all you need to do was lift the car up. You'd go, yeah, I'll give it a go. (laughs) Yeah. If it was your child dying under the car, would you be able to lift the car up? Yes. And it's a whole different feeling. 
And one of the things you need to be able to do in, in for, we were working very hard is to be able to turn on that raw emotion at the right time in the race to deliver the best possible result you can get. Um, and the best athletes can do that. And it takes a while to work, to be able to control that release of adrenaline, additional adrenaline to be able to get that advantage. Um, and I don't know, you know, in our race, it was incredibly close. We got, we, the Germans were going to win the gold medal, whatever we came in, um, it, we were coming in in silver medal position. The Russians stole it back from us. And then we managed in the dying strokes, managed to pull it back from them. And the margin of success of bronze or silver was four centimeters. That's 0.2 of a millimeter per stroke. Um, and it does come down to the little, the, you know, imagining how do I bring my emotional desire into my race without destroying my race plan, but bringing out that additional free speed that we used to talk about. What was it like? crossing crossing that line did you know who'd won when you crossed the line and yeah, who, we, who no, got who got silver yeah i mean for us we we the night before the night before um because the olympics um the olympic village is, is just unbelievable i mean there is um if you imagine the largest tesco's you've ever been into like the really huge 24-hour ones that's the dining hall it took us it took me four days to find the butter in sydney you know, you have to agree where you're going to sit before you go and get your food because you'll come back and you can't find anyone to sit with. You know, so it's that it's everything is so big. So what we did in the um, just before Sydney was we moved out to some some houses that were, that the spare rowers were in. I think they then got put in hotels. And the night before our final, we got, got put in this in these houses and we had our supper um, in the garage. So they turned the garage into a little dining hall. And we had our supper in there on those plastic white chairs and we sat down. What do we want to do tomorrow? We spoke about how we wanted to feel after the race. We wanted to feel like there was nothing else we could give. We wanted to come. And I remember after my race in Atlanta, it took me 20 minutes to get from the finish line to the landing pontoon. That's how much I'd given in my race. And I said, that's I want to feel like that. And our chief coach, Mike, he was going, OK, guys. And his pre-race talk was Guys, you know, when you're in the race and you think you're about to die, it's OK. No one's ever died from rowing. You're only 2 percent on the way to death. Tomorrow, I want you to go out and find the other 98 percent. So so it was quite a lot to think about that night when I went to sleep. But really, for us, what we wanted to do was we wanted to not come fifth. And we knew that on paper we would come fourth. So that was our form because of the heats and the repechages prior to that on paper we come for. So what we thought was if we, we just absolutely have to hound the Russians down because the Ukrainians were favourite for bronze. So we thought that if we, we went aim for the sun, we might land on the moon. And that's what we did. And we, we, we just absolutely nailed everything. And Mike said to us, and he said, you asked our average stroke, but it was 34 strokes per minute. And he goes, when you need it at a tactical point in the race, you're going to go to 36 strokes per minute. Now, we'd never even completed a race at 36. So it was almost like sitting in a Ferrari. And it's like someone saying to you, there's seven gears. And you can, you know, if you want to, you could go faster. And so for us in our race, we had to pretty much go into the unknown. And it really delivered for us. I mean, and Great Britain, we won our first, Great Britain's first um, women's Olympic silver medal that day in Sydney. And the crazy thing was, is that it spent us we then another three Olympics winning silver medals, which was epically good, good results. Till of course London 2012 when we won our first gold medal for the women's team. So that was um, Helen Glover and Catherine Granger in in the pair and in the double. Well, were your family over in Sydney to watch? Yeah, my dad and my brother was uh, were over. Unfortunately, my mother had died from cancer a couple of years before, and and one of the things she'd said to us, she'd said. Um, Gwyn and Miriam, I, I love coming to watch you at the World Championships, but you never do well together and you never do badly together. And one of you does really well and one of you does really bad. So I don't know if it was a laugh or cry. <laughs> so it'd be really great if you got in the same boat as each other. So Sydney was the only time my sister and I um, ever raced in the same boat at an Olympic Games or a World Championships. Um, and we almost wished that we had earlier, but we'd never found a coach that was strong enough to coach us because, you know, having siblings in a boat is always going to be hard work. What an amazing thing to have experienced with your sister. Like, I think that's incredible. I'm very close to my sister, so it's lovely to hear to, to hear that that's, um, you've got this amazing silver medal. Where do you keep your silver medal? 
I always keep it in a sock drawer. <laughs> always look, always look, always open your sock drawer every single day. You know it's there. Occasionally I put it somewhere else. I leave it somewhere and it's like, oh my God, where is it? Some people put, some people put their medals in, um, you know, cabinets and things. But because I, you know, there's 8 million young people out there in Great Britain. And time when I won our medal, there was only about 300 medalists in the UK. And the chance for kid test driving a medal and so I, I always take it out and put it in my pocket. And when I'm talking to the school kids, get them to test drive it. Because, of course, if, you know, you don't know where it doesn't fit, you might not want to go and get one. What was it like after So you achieved this goal? Did you allow yourself to enjoy it and embrace it? Or was it almost like straight away, right, what's next? It's um, the biggest, as you said, what did I feel like when I crossed the line? Well, A, I just hurt enormously because unfortunately <laughs> it hurts horrendously because all of a sudden the lactic blood with all the lactate goes everywhere rather than just in certain parts of the muscles. It was a sense of relief, the overriding sense of relief that I hadn't wasted 10 years of my life. And it's sad that that's it, you know, but that sense of satisfaction, there are people on the national team and they're in all sports, they will give as much and they will come away with nothing. They're the guys that come, you know, the fourths and the fifths and the semi-finalists. And, you know, they do as much. And I was relieved, humbled that, you know, I'd been able to do it. You know, and that's why I feel very, I have an overarching desire to go and help other athletes to give back because I was really lucky to come away with an Olympic medal. And I guess I, how did I feel afterwards? I think this is going to be emerging more and more now through our um, elite athletes as they come out, but they really struggle. To be honest, I spent eight weeks um, in Australia afterwards spending time with my brother and stuff, but I I couldn't do anything. I I literally didn't want to time meet anyone at a set time. So for about a week, I just w- got up in the morning um, and walked around Sydney. And then at about three o'clock, came back. And, you know, met up with my brother after he'd been um, to work and then did the same thing again. It was almost like I had some form of um, post-event thing going on psychologically. Um, I couldn't plan to meet anyone at set time. I didn't want to commit to anything. And I was staying at a friend, a friend from university, uh, Sam Hampson, who'd known me when I first started rowing. I was staying in his house. He said, Gwyn, you're in the most amazing country in the world. Get in a car and go somewhere. And of course, they had lots of hire cars where you could do one way higher away from Sydney, which was perfect. And so I remember getting a car, and I know this sounds really weird, and deciding I want to go and find some red sand. That's all I wanted to do. So I literally hired a car out of Sydney until I found some red sand. And I remember wanting to eat, and I was eating sweets instead of eating meals. And it was so liberating because everything in my life had been controlled and timed and measured and all about getting the best to win this Olympic medal. And now all of a sudden, I didn't need to do any of that. And I didn't want any structure. And I, I mean, on one occasion, I was driving on a dirt road. I mean, God knows what, <laughs> if the whole my car had broken down, heading out, I found the red sand. And once I found the red sand, I then drove down onto the ocean road and came back and um, met up with friends um, in Melbourne. It was my brother's 30th and we went to the um, Melbourne Cup and had a really good time. But, you know, there was still, there was a real psychological down after the Olympics for me. And I probably should have been around rowers. I should have been around um, my team um, back in the UK rather than on my own. When did you want to get back into a boat again? Or was that the furthest thing from your mind? Yeah, it, I think it's, I, I wanted to get in the boats. In fact, um, we'd worked, um, done some stuff with, um, I then drove up, um, then drove up to um, Brisbane and met up with some of the surf rowers that, because we'd always been going to Sydney. So we'd had some friends that were surf rowers, so I went and did some surf rowing and stuff. Um, it was the training and the system that I didn't want to get back into. And then I remember, um, you know, I had to get back into the UK. We had a test in November and a uh, test in November and then trials and I literally came back two days before that and went straight cold into jet lagged and everything into the trials. Of course, I didn't do very well. And then I, I then got back into the system but and, and stroked the women's eight um, at the World Championships that year. Um, but then started to struggle with um, overtraining. I had um, I went out to train with the Canadian team out in Canada um, for four or five weeks Um 
in 2000 with the winter of 2001 and I thought what was jet lag no what was a virus I thought was jet lagged and trained through it and it was a virus and three months later I came down with overtraining and had to start building up from a five minute walk to a 10 minute walk to a etc it took me six months to get back um, and I then got back went to final trials and didn't I'd always ever always come first and second in final trials um, when we'd started to do it in the single skull and I came fifth and I remember coming away from it and not thinking oh my god this is the end of the world I haven't come first or second I was came away thinking okay and I realized that the hunger had gone you know I didn't I wasn't desperate to win I wasn't desperate to be part of that and at that point I realized that I had to retire because I, you know, the hunger and the desire to get up and put your body through what you need to do every day had gone. And I came out and started getting on with my life. What age did you retire? So I was 34. 34, so retired. <laughs> retired at 34. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, some of the guys, I mean, you know, Catherine, Catherine Granger, who, of course, was in our boat in Sydney. That was her first Olympic Games. She retired in Rio this year in her 40s. You know, the guy's really able to keep going. I think some of it now is that they get the money that they get from it means that they can actually, you know, they can live and they can get houses, etc. now. Whereas in our day, everything was on hold. You were just crashing into debt the whole time. After a while, um, you realize that you, you've just got to get on with life um, and you need to put money aside and you need to get onto the housing ladder and you've got to put a pension in there. And, you know, I think that weighs on your brain mentally, um, that weighs on your brain. And you think, actually, I've got to retire. It comes down psychologically. It eats away at that hunger. 34 years old, you've completed this lifelong dream. You've got a silver medal from the Sydney Olympics. You've retired. And what do you go and do next? Because obviously your whole life has been rowing and structured and controlled. And then suddenly it's like freedom or? Freedom, yeah. Um, no, I think for me, because of course I stopped mid-season. So I didn't finish at the end of the season. So I was still as fit as a butcher's dog. So I thought, well, what else could I do? You know, I'm not, I can't go to the, you know, any of the events I pulled out of the international scene. And so what I'd always been really interested is at age 19, I'd wanted to be the first woman to row an ocean. Of course, stacks of people had gone out there and done that in the time I'd been um, doing my Olympic rowing. But I thought what would be really cool would be to go and row the English Channel. Um, and there was a guy who'd rowed the English Channel. He's a reverend and he'd rowed it in something like t in 1901 or something. And um, he would put his boat. He was he was a reverend up in the um, Lake District and he would put his boat on the train and he'd gone down to Dover and he'd taken it off the train and he'd rowed it across. I think it took him five hours. And then he put it on the boat train uh, on the boat train coming back from Calais and he made it back up in time for the Sunday service. So he was the first person to row the English Channel in a in a, in a sweep um, boat in a in a boat sorry in a sliding rigger, and then there was the men's record which um, had then been broken again in in the eighties by a guy called Ivor Lloyd and it stood at three hours thirty eight minutes or something like that. And I went and met Ivor and talked to him and he showed me what he'd done and I realised all his nutrition was a little bit suspect and he was um, stopping too frequently and he was actually stopping to eating rather than just getting on with it and so I could see that there were loads of things that I could do to improve it but he was at the top of his game he was one of the best coastal rowers um, at the time for Great Britain and so I knew I had to somehow if I was going to beat his time I'd have to go in a quicker boat there was only one type of boat that's quicker than a coastal boat um, and that's a fine river skull and so you know it weighs 14 kilos it's smaller than your backside and I waited four months for the right day to get the crossing day. I had to go on an absolute flat, flat, calm day. And I went over in three hours, 14. Um, and a friend of mine went, we, he went at the same time. He was in his fifties and he did it eight minutes slower than me. So that's the men's record. And the women's record is eight minutes faster than men's record. So that's what I did. Oh, that's what you do when you retire from um, <laughs> Olympic rowing. <laughs> you smashed it. That's awesome. What was it like getting over to France? Did you have your passport? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I didn't have my passport. We went over and I mean, I so I come in on the waves and you know, get a bit smashed up as I come in on the beach. There's one man standing there with his fishing rod 
and I've just broken the world record. And then I turned back out because, of course, I'd stuck my hand up in the air as soon as I put my foot on the floor so they could stop the clock. But there's nobody there. There's no cheering. It's just deathly silence. Oh, well done, Gwen. There's no <laughs> photographers. There's nothing. And so, um, yeah, I then just rode back out to the guys on the on the support boat and we managed to put the single on the back of the support boat. I was paying a hundred pounds an hour to this support boat to take me across. I'm sure we went back slower than we went across. <laughs> he was definitely making his money on the way back. I learned a lot from that. And it was the beginning of my sort of mini, my sort of expedition career, I suppose. I'd gone and tried to do a lot of research because of course I'd, nobody had ever gone in these fine river boats, you know, 14 kilos is nothing. It's a tiny boat. So I went to the rowing, the rowing community and about half of the rowing, my, my rowing community had said it's, it'll break up. When it hits the big washes off those container ships, it's going to break in half. So I thought, well, I'll go down to the coastal community on the south coast of the UK and start talking to the guys that didn't meet anybody that said it was possible to get across. And then I started to get phone calls. I remember getting a phone call from one, one person saying, Gwyn, you're bringing the sport into disrepute. You shouldn't do it. And I, I then started, I remember waking up in the middle of the night going, ah, I'm bringing my sport into disrepute, I mustn't do it. And it just started to really eat at me. And I, I had to start shutting down. I stopped telling anyone what we were doing. I, I just kept really quiet about it. And the most satisfying feeling was that, you know, on the way back, texting people saying, yeah, the boat didn't break up. It was fine. It's easy. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. No problem. <laughs> and, and it was about understanding belief. You know, I knew it was possible. What I was finding is that the people around me didn't believe them. And so they were eroding my belief. It's one of the hardest things is when you're out there trying to break world records and, and world firsts is belief. You know, making sure that you um, believe in yourself and, you know, making sure you surround yourselves with the people that believe you can do it. It's hard enough just taking on the baggage of all the people around you that don't believe you know, and you, you, you just, you just got to get out there and do it. And, and as I said, just surround yourselves with the people that believe in you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes all it takes is for one person. I mean, I've actually seen, I've seen it, I've seen it happen quite a lot when, um, when somebody says to somebody who maybe doesn't have a rock solid belief in themselves, that, which is not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. They just don't necessarily have that self belief in themselves. And somebody says, Oh no, you can't do it. You can't do it. And they take that literally they take it to heart they're like okay you're right I actually I can't do it and then they don't even try and they just lose this opportunity and oh you just somebody having belief in you can be so empowering you've done a lot of work you talked about going into schools but you've actually done a lot of work with with young people for the charity that you work for can you just share a little bit more about what you're doing in that space so I've worked for the Esport Trust now for about 12 years. It's quite a unique charity. We're a national charity. We primarily work with um, state schools um, and the teachers in the state schools to help um, improve the PE and physical activity in school sport. Um, and one of the things when I came out of, of being an athlete was this give back. I'd gone to a school and I, I didn't understand why. Would, why would I? Why do I need to sit and work? I didn't understand it all. I didn't understand the rules of school. And it was sport that helped me experiment with my behavior and, and then learn my own self-respect and then the respect of the teachers because I was good at being naughty and I was winning. Sport was able to turn me around. So I started to realize that um, if you want to get ahead in life, you've got to understand the rules of life, play by those rules, and then you can get what you want. What I felt was that there were some fantastic stories of elite athletes, what they'd done, and especially some of the athletes I was coming across who'd come from really troubled backgrounds and had really tough times. And I was trying to work out is how can, if I'd had someone like me come to talk to me when I was at school, it would have been a lot easier to work it out. So I went to the eSport Trust um, and I'd said it would be brilliant to do some form of athlete role model program. And they were thinking about the same thing. Um, and Sue Campbell, who was the CEO at the time, she goes, absolutely, Gwyn, we need to go and find some money to do this. So I went away and spent time talking to elite athletes and finding out what we would do with the young people around creating this behavioral change and work with some psychologists to come up with a structure by which the athletes could tell their stories. And Sue went and found the money. And we found the money from an organization. Well, it was Sky. And Sky have uh, pretty much run an athlete role model program now for 10 years and put a, put a million pounds into it to get athletes into schools to help 
young people on the verge of exclusion or really struggling with their confidence to be able to gain their reconnection back into schools. We came up with six six keys, we called them, and it was with 20 athletes just before the Athens Olympics. We sat down and we looked at all this research that um, a psychologist had done and all this fancy language, and we turned it into normal athlete language, and we took it from 10 items to six items. And, you know, and that's what, for 10 years, um, through the Sky Sport Living for Sport program, the athletes have been delivering in schools and they've got around about 100. I, I, I now just, I'm the grandmother of it all, really. I, I don't organize it. They just come and ask me for advice now and again. But there's about 100, 120 athletes on the books now visiting in schools. They're doing thousands of visits. And it's amazing. And, you know, we came up with the six keys. So the first one was hunger, hunger to achieve. How much do you want something? If you really want tickets to your favorite band, what's the length of queue you're going to sit in? Well, it's no different. Um, it's no different to life. We then talked about um, things like um, social skills, people skills. Um, we talked about um, sports knowledge, which actually is life knowledge, the rules of life. To about planning for success, which is, you know, you know, if I was five minutes late for every training session of my international career, I would have missed six months of training. I wouldn't even have gone to the Olympic Games let alone win a silver medal for it by four centimetres. And that's incredibly powerful talking to, to youngsters about that. It's the small things really do matter. So, yeah, so, so we've done that and it's been great fun. And I've met some amazing athletes. And, and the athletes that we've always selected are the ones that come from the most challenging backgrounds. They've had a problem somewhere in their lives. One athlete, you know, the amazing power, because I would go in and mentor the athletes and, and, and listen to their stories and help them develop their stories stronger. You know, and there's nothing more powerful when you go into a school and you're with the youngsters and you turn around and say, well, yeah, my... I was fostered twice as a as, as a as a young person, and my father was in prison. Yet I still went out and became one of the most successful athletes of my generation. And it helps to paint the. I mean, that's not me. That was one of the other athletes. But it helps the the a lot of the youngsters. You know, realise actually. You know, I've got a tough life, but here's somebody who has done it, and maybe maybe I can start to paint the picture, and and start to succeed. Absolutely. Oh, God, it's just inspiring because it really, even just that, that little saying, I mean, being able to picture it, if you, you know, if you turned up late for, you know, just, just five minutes, it doesn't even, you know, it's, it's almost nothing, but actually throughout all of your training, suddenly it's six months. It's just suddenly like, wow, it is the small daily habits that you do day in, day out, which do, does make a massive difference. Now, are you turning, is it, are you, when's your, is it your 50th birthday this year? Oh, how did you know that? Yes, I'm going big 5-0. I'm halfway through my life. Ooh. Absolutely. And what are you going to be doing to celebrate? Um, I don't know at the moment. Um, I've got a plan for the summer. Maybe we could turn that into my 50th um, plan. <laughs> we're, what we're trying to do, because um, I'm really fascinated by going fast on the water. And while I did the Ocean Row last, um, last summer, it, it's it's a big slow boat you know when you're crossing oceans you need to be out there and you need to be in everything that that nature throws at you i quite like to specialize in some of the coast the crossings and coastal stuff in in much smaller boats where my rowing skill can come out as well and so we're going to try and get from land's end to um broadstairs so right the other end of kent and we reckon that we could do it in three days um, of rowing that's how quick we think we could go in a rowing boat uh, who's who are you doing that with is that a big team or a small team yeah so at the moment i've got um there's four people in the team at the moment i need eight to make it work so we've got a boat which is two people two people in the boat um and what we'll do is we'll change the crew over probably about every 90 minutes and then row through the night because we don't uh, we don't want anyone in the water at night time we'll be dropping the crew into the water and then as you as the boat comes up to it to the two oh, two guys are tired or jump out and the two fresh guys will jump in and then they'll go on for another 90 minutes and then we'll drop the next crew in front of them um, from the support boat and just keep going you know through the day and then through the night we reckon it's about five hours without where we won't be able to drop anyone into the water um, and so the there'll be there'll be three nights where we probably need to have two pairs um, sorry three pairs rowing the nights through the five hour shift oh my god that sounds very random <laughs> random well it's quite interesting and it's an interesting observation 
So what I've done is I've brought the, I don't know if you ever heard of outrigger canoeing. No, no, tell me more. So outrigger canoeing is the most amazing sport. It's absolutely, it's, a, it's got very deep heritage. It's based in the Pacific. It's really big in New Zealand, Australia, um, of course, Hawaii, Tahiti, um, and on the West Coast of the US. And they have um, their long distance races, uh, about seven or eight hour races, and they're called change races. And the women are often raced with a crew of 10, but there's only six in the boat. The guys will row with a crew of nine, but they have six in the boat. Um, some of the races in Tahiti, they'll have 12 crew um, and only six in the boat. And what you do is you literally drop the guys in the ocean and the guys jump out. They change literally every 20 minutes rather than um, we're going for 90s. And, you you know, I mean, I've raced um, the Molokai, which is sort of the world um, championships of outrigger canoeing. And you race the Channel of Bones, which I don't know if you ever heard of the north shore of Oahu. No. where all the big surf waves are. You know, when they have those big competitions, that's yeah, where it yeah, is. Yeah. Just next to that is the channel, the channel of bones, the Kiwa channel, and the waves get up to the size of houses. And what you do is in the outrigger canoes is you race downwind. So you basically got a, a wave the size of a house coming in behind you and you absolutely surfing down the waves, which is great fun. But you're also dropping people into the ocean. Um, and changing the crew every 20, 40 minutes. We did it in 2013 with a crew from Royal Canoe Club in Kingston. Um, and we did it in seven hours coming across the channel. And it was great fun. We finished on Waikiki Beach. It was, you know, was this, the, you know, sort of dolphins. The water's deep, deep blue. Um, and there's a community. There's a community of about five outrigger clubs in the UK. And they go and race Tahiti, um, Hawaii. Um, we sometimes go and race in the Mediterranean. It's, we don't tend not to do many changes in the UK because it's bloody cold. I was going to say, <laughs> I'm totally up for the Hawaii, the Mediterranean. That sounds great for, you know, this hardcore 30 minutes, get hot and sweaty, jump in the ocean, cool off, a little bit of a break. The UK, not so yeah. much. It's a little bit yeah, so we... Has this been done before in the UK? No. So the only other place where they do change, where they do um, water changes is a particular race down in Australia um, it's, it's, it's called the Bass Race, um, and they do it with surf boats, and they take it around the – sponsored by the Australian Navy, and they'll drop rowers into the water. I took um, a group of tourists, rowing tourists. We went on a, a rowing safari to the Maldives in, um, in, in 2015, and we developed this water change for, for the type of boats that I'll be using this summer um, and then the only thing is that, of course, in the UK, the water's colder. So the water will be about 16 degrees. So we just need to be from a safety perspective. We just when people are tired, we need to make sure we're really slick. And I've timed it in such a way that we should only be in the water for about a minute and a half um, in the whole duration of it, of the change. And the change should take us 15 minutes if we're really quick. So at most, you'll be in the water a minute if we can get it right. See that it does actually sound now. Now you've sort of properly explained it, I can I can visualise what was, what will be happening. So it does <laughs> it does sound it does sound fun. And so you're going. For, is that so? It'll be the first time it's ever been done. So it'll be a brand new record, which will be really exciting. Yeah, we're making up the rules. We're I making up it. the rules. Is this yeah. going to be an all female team or mixed team? Well, I wanted to be an all female team, but at the moment I just can't get enough women who've got the rowing technical skill. Because we're going to be race, we're going to be rowing through some some round some of the headlands. The water's going to be really rough. So I need guys that are um, club level rowers or international rowers, you know, top club level rowers. So I need a degree of skill. And then I'm looking for people that are confident in rowing themselves in deep water, <laughs> you know, and trying to find trying to find women. And also you need the weekends um, between um, over the over this summer and and into the. The weather window, we're going to try and pick a two-week weather window in August where everyone needs to be on standby to do it. Um, and finding just finding that combination, I'm really struggling. What's the best way for people to find out more information about you? Are you on social media? Yeah, I am. So the best bet really, in essence, is um, especially around our Ocean Row um, this summer. So it's Rannoch Women's Challenge. Um, if they just type that in, they'll get the our website up. Um, which is a WordPress website. And also, um, I'm on Twitter, which is Gwyn Batten. For women out there who do want to get involved in rowing, what is your best advice for them? Absolutely. Well, there's two ways, really. If you want to get out um, and 
row as, as in the sport of rowing. You've just got to get down to your local rowing club. Um, British Rowing is the website um, the website to be able to locate your nearest club. And the best time of day to go down is that this time of year is brilliant. So the spring is a really good time to go down and join jo- join a club all the autumn. Just go down to your local rowing club at about nine o'clock on a Saturday or a Sunday morning and say, I'm really interested in learning to row. And they will um, put you in the novice group and you'll be with a bunch, a load of other people learning to row and it'll be hilarious. And those will be friends you make for life. If you want to go out and do ocean rowing, you need to start putting, typing in ocean rowing, go on YouTube and start to see what it looks like. There's two amazing races um, that I would advise people to probably go and do. One, which is the Talisker race, which is from the Canaries to Antigua. Um, and then there's a really exciting one that's called the Great Pacific Race, which um, is from San Francisco to Hawaii. Um, and the great thing about doing a race, if you want to be an ocean rower, is, of course, you've got the support and you've got people around you. Um, doing an unsupported crossing like we did is is quite hard work in the terms of you're very exposed. But if you want to get advice and you just want to talk to someone, one of the companies out there that make the fastest boats that we used is, is Rannoch Adventure. And they're based in Burnham on Crouch. So um, out in um, Essex. That's why our boat was called Liberty of Essex. So type in Rannoch Adventure and make contact with, with Charlie Pitcher or Angus Collins and they can talk you through the first steps of becoming an ocean rower. Awesome. Gwyn, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share more of your story. And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to talk about your Atlantic row, doing it the wrong way around. But I know we'll have you back on again at a future date to share more about rowing and what you've been up to. I'm super excited for the year ahead. It's going to be amazing for you, especially as you enter the 50th, your 50th year. Super exciting. Um, But thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Sarah, for everything you're doing. It's just an absolute role model for for people out there. And I really enjoy listening to your podcasts and a pleasure to be one of them. Thank you. Hey Tribe, how are you getting on? Hope you're having a fabulous day, whatever you are doing. I thought Gwyn was just absolutely amazing. One of the things that I wanted to do was I actually went onto YouTube and found the YouTube video of the row. So going back to Sydney Olympics in 2000 to watch that race again. And it's completely different watching it after you get the insight from Gwyn. And you can see the pressure and the drive and the stress and the tension as it comes down to the wire. And what's really weird is I know the result. I know they get the silver medal, but watching that race, I was almost like screaming at the screen and just seeing how close it was, honestly, just absolutely amazing to get this insight. So what I would do, if you've got the time, just pop onto YouTube, watch the rowing video from the Sydney 2000 Olympics from the fours and just picture yourself in that position. Because Gwyn talked a lot about the, the mental side, which I think is so important for whatever challenges you've got coming up. So let me just tell you what the next few episodes are going to be in July. We've got some cracking episodes coming out. We're going to be speaking with Nungshi and Tashi Malik, who you may know as the Everest twins. So they are Indian and they were the youngest twins, the youngest siblings. At 23 years old, they went and climbed Mount Everest and they then went on to go and do the Grand Slam and they do a huge amount of good, good, fantastic stuff actually for gender equality in India and around the world. So an absolutely fantastic episode. Next up, I then spoke to, or coming up on the podcast, is Shu Pillinger. Her episode will be coming out on the 11th of July and Shu is an ultra runner. She Oh, is the national champion for a double Ironman. Absolutely amazing. She's also the first woman to win Ram, the race across America. Really, really great stories. Lots of great advice as well. She's also helping out Jasmine Muller with her Le Jog Challenge, which is going to be happening in September. On the 18th of July, we're speaking with Tina Muir. And Tina is a GB runner, an elite runner. Her, marath- her best marathon time is two hours, 36 minutes, which is phenomenal. But that's, that's, well, that is phenomenal. But what we talk about more with Tina is about her running and how she actually fell out of love with running and how now she's on the journey of going after or trying to get her health back. She hasn't had a period for nine years. And she's now on this new mis- mission to actually talk about this topic and, and 
and try and get more women to make sure that they are listening to their body. So she's on a mission to get her period back. So really, really fascinating episode. So I think you're going to enjoy them all. Please do hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Then then you will automatically get updates coming through to your computer. Mini challenge for you. Make sure you tell one person about the Tough Girl podcast. My goal for the podcast this year is for it to be listened to over half a million times. So if you can tell one person, then it really does help the message to spread by the power of word of mouth. If you haven't left a review on iTunes, please do that as well. A five-star review will be absolutely amazing. I couldn't do this podcast without the support of my patrons, the financial backers who support me every single month by donating five, ten, fifteen dollars a month to help fund the running costs. It makes a massive difference knowing that you are there supporting me. I just want to do a quick shout out to some of my regular patrons, my regular supporters um, who are there for me every single month. Rochelle Olson, who's also been on the Tough Girl podcast as well, well worth checking her episode out. Leah Atherton, G. Kaplinska, Caroline Welling, and my sister from Raise the Bar life coaching you'll probably hear her quite a lot on my tough girl daily podcast kimberly stinson lisa mccoy amanda jury bethany taylor aaron hayes angela davis you guys are absolutely rocking it i appreciate your support so much it really does make a massive massive difference i've now got over a hundred patrons supporting me which is incredible and you too can become a patron just go to patreon www.patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast and it's so simple and easy to do and you can then become a part of this mission you will know that every time you listen to the podcast it's because of you and your contribution you're part of something bigger and actually it doesn't matter what amount you support because this is about the cumulative effort if every single person who listens to the podcast sponsored me one dollar or two dollars or three dollars or four dollars or whatever it is it would make a huge amount of difference in terms of what I can do and what I can achieve in terms of getting this message out there increasing the amount of female role models in the media this is the 107th episode. There's no sign of me stopping. So I can't wait till we get to celebrate the 200th episode. I hope you'll be there with me. Have an amazing day, whatever you are doing. At the moment, I'm currently out on the Appalachian Trail through hiking, averaging 22 miles a day. I hope that you can follow my journey along um, with me on my YouTube channel. If you go to toughguardchallenges.com, you can find all of the links to my show notes, to all of the other information that you could find. If you're new to the podcast, you can also read any of my books through the website from Climbing Kilimanjaro to working as a chalet host to running the toughest foot race on earth. Anyway, guys, um, it is awesome to have you listening. Awesome to have your support. Get out there and go after your dreams. Work hard, be strong, and just remember to believe in yourself and ignore all the haters and ignore all the doubters and all the people who say you can't do it because you know what? You can do it. You can do whatever you set your mind to. Have a great day, everyone. Lots of love. Bye.